Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former ECW World Heavyweight Champion and WWE Intercontinental Champion. You may know him as Ezekiel Jackson, but he is Big Rick, Rick Lawn Stevens. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Um, hey, man, I'm good. How are you? Doing very good. So what's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Um, being a husband, being a father. <laughs> um running my uh, personal training business and um that's been it and just preaching um just uh full life nice obviously you know you said you had something you wanted to promote or something you had going on so what what's like the big news or what's the latest on what you've got going on no it's more so um my website reclon.com um my venture currently is personal training uh before i got to the wwe i was personal training um while i was there you know some of the guys used to get workouts from me um and now i have my website which is ricklon.com and i've got i think five of my favorite workouts on there and just you not know, a big promotion or anything like that but it's just uh different phases different uh part of life and that's where i am right now just wanted to talk about my uh, website um and that's it but let's talk wrestling let's talk life you know what i mean yeah absolutely so you got the <laughs> you know the, the website but really everybody knows you from the wrestling world you made a big splash in wb how did you actually <laughs> get into wb was it upw first and then they recruited you was it with uh, ricky bassman and then they kind of recruited you from there yeah um i was i started uh training actually in brooklyn i trained in um it was called LIWF when I started, and then they became Doghouse. But you got Homicide out in New York. Um, at the time, my, one of my trainers was Layton. We had Low Key, um, Xavier, the late Xavier came through there. Um, Julia Smokes, a lot of the cats that did um, ROH earlier in the day. And so I trained there. Um, you know, did a few independent shows on the East Coast, jumped over to Jersey when they shut down and worked with. Um, Gino Caruso over in um, ECPW, and I I was not as versed in the independent scene as I should have been. Um, I assumed, you know, probably a little bit um, with my look and my size, I assumed uh, something bigger would have just showed up. Didn't realize that I have to earn <laughs> um, right. a trip. Yep. You know, so a lot of the stuff that was happening on the East Coast, I never got a chance to, to take part in because I um, I wanted to be in the WWE. That was like my goal, you know, and a lot of the indie stuff, I didn't fall in love with it. Um, I did a couple of shows and when the pay wasn't, you know, when it cost more to drive my truck there, <laughs> um yep. it kind of wavered and you know then my family my wife and i my wife's an actress we were both doing a lot of commercials in new york um while i was just starting to wrestle we bought super bowl commercials and all these different things she did the Chappelle show um so we were like maybe hollywood is where we need to go um when i came to hollywood i actually went out to the upw show and i spoke with rick bassman and the, and the guy the time i guess the guy name was anthony roses and they were trying to i think at the time trying to get a developmental system set up in you in uh san clemente um so i think uh you know first time i went there i met chavo guerrero and then they sent bill the mod out to work us out and that's from where that's where it built into a commitment from me where it was weekly driving to la i don't know if you've been in la traffic um, it was a two hour drive to San Clemente and a three hour back home, wow. um, to spend three hours there to wrestle and do promos, which I, which helped me a great deal. Um, one of the trainers was the late, um, Mike Bell, Mad Dog Bell, Mike Bell. And he freaking really got in on me on being able to, being comfortable of screaming and yelling because I'm a very soft spoken cat. I don't like this is my volume unless I'm watching uh, wrestling with my <laughs> watching wrestling or watching something that gets me excited. And he really helped me to find that personality um, when it came to wrestling. So 
yeah, so, you know, Rick Bassman became my branch. I got to go visit WWE, and then I got signed down by John Laurinaitis. But it took me, it was a seven-year journey from the time I started in 2000 um, in New York to getting signed in 2007. Wow, I didn't realize that it took you that long. I thought it was almost like super quick that you got signed. Yeah, a lot of people assume that because I was a big guy, I came through UPW and there was a backdoor. Right? No, I, worked, I didn't, like I said, I didn't do the independent show because I honestly didn't know. I did not know how to get on shows. I didn't know how to, you know, I assumed um, the guys I were working with at the time would have introduced me to different promoters, but it never happened. Um, I was supposed to go, I think one time uh, we drove <laughs> to Connecticut on a Sunday to wrestle those two guys and they're like, uh, you guys are too big <laughs> to wow. wrestle our guys. Um, you know, I was told, hey, on many occasions, hey, I'm going to come and pick you up. We got this, you know, to go to uh, WXW down in um, Alpha's uh, place down in uh, Pennsylvania. And I'll come and pick you up. And two hours later, it's like, oh, I, I forgot. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yep. So stuff like that happened to me, which put a bitter taste in my mouth about just people at that time so my you know um when i i think when i realized that upw might have been at the t a good branch that's when i was like let me give it a shot um and i honestly quit quit a job <laughs> um to give it a run i told my wife six months give me the, let me get this uh approach and let me try this one more time and if not um i'll shift and coming close to the fifth month, I got signed. So, um, yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't quick. It was it was long and hard. Thankfully, no major injuries. But I did a couple of small shows on the East Coast. You know, WWW. I think it was one place in Harlem, uh, ECPW, and um, but those are the guys that I got a chance to go train with. Got a chance to just get into it, and it was cool. Now, too big. I don't know if I've ever heard that before. Like as a wrestling <laughs> excuse, right? That's crazy. You figure they would love that. Well, um, I guess the guys they had, I get. In the long run, it worked out that we didn't have to put some guys over that possibly would have wouldn't even benefited anybody. You know what I mean? So, um, it was it was what it was. So with you and kind of getting looked at by Johnny Ace and signed by Johnny Ace, how does that kind of process go? How does he find it? He just because they're associated with WB developmental wise. So um, with UPW, uh, we went backstage um, at a show in LA. Actually, I, you know, I think, I honestly think that's the night that uh, Crime Time debuted um, in LA. Um, like I knew Shad from before because of uh, bouncing and security work and bodyguard work in New York. Um, so it was, and the guy, uh, Teddy the Tank, uh, who introduced, got me started at LIWF, got him set up in, uh, at OVW. So it was like a you know bond there from that. And so when we go backstage, you do the polite thing. You try to introduce yourself. You're not, you know, you do the backstage etiquette, then you learn it. And um, like we didn't get a chance to go in the ring or nothing because it was a big show. But I was told afterwards that, oh, they want me to fly to Deep South to do a trial in January. And um, so, you know, I, that's how it became. I got a chance to meet Johnny Ace. I got a chance to be backstage and you know, I put on my nice blue shirt and, you know, try to hide the muscles, but it was hard to. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. So does he say like you're the prototypical WB guy, you know, because, you know, Vince loves his huge guys, you know, the monsters, the larger than life. Does he say that? No, no. It's like, go, you can give you a tryout if you, if you uh, go try out. So for the week I went there, I was supposed to go to Deep South. But that was the same time Deep South had like where they let go like about 17 people. So they ended up flipping me and sending me up to Louisville with um, uh, Al Snow. And they, you know, put me, he's like, can you work? I was like, I can go. So I got in the ring. Uh, they put me in there with um, 
<clears throat> sorry, I'm getting old. But I got in the ring and showed that I could work a little at the time. Um, then they put me on the TV show, the, the opening, a dark match for that Thursday night. And uh, it was okay, you know. Um, worked this cat named Jamin, got, Jamin Olivencia, but Jamin really busted his ass to make me look good. And um, after that, I got the phone call. So it wasn't like, do we going to do anything? with It's just like, hey, we offer you a contract to go. It's going to be either Louisville or Deep South. And I end up in Deep South. When you go down there, are you thinking like you're only going to be down there for a little bit? You're going to get called up or you're not even thinking of that yet? Of course. Everybody, come on. It's, uh, you have to be confident in yourself. Um, because I was at my size, I was, when I got signed, I was about 285. Um, I was super athletic. My finisher when I was in the doghouse was a, uh, a tribute to, um, Macho Man, an elbow from the top rope. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I used to, I can go, I used to be able to do stuff from the top rope, a lot of drop kicks, but because when you were trained with a certain level of guys and these cats were going, you had to be able to keep up with them. Um, then when I got there, they're like, why? <laughs> You're big as hell. Why? You know right. what I mean? Yeah, you don't need so to. Was like, that's when I they like keep pulling, like, nope, you don't have to do that anymore. Nope, you don't have to do that. And it kind of formulated that character of be able to uh, be intense and everything you do, make sure it makes sense. It wasn't like, oh, we got to do 15 punches just to get, you know, like one of your punches is five other dudes' punches. I was like, right. oh, you know what I mean? And yeah. let the character, and that's where they worked with me on um, learning to pull back, but also understanding their approach to wrestling because they have a different style. They have a different thing that, you know, is very television based. And, <clears throat> you know, that's what ended up happening in Deep South. Then we shut down in Deep South after like, I got there, um, I think like March 7th or something like that. And then they shut us down like April 20th, which was like two days before my birthday. And they're like, we'll figure out where you're going. <laughs> I'm like, dude, my, I just packed my family up. We moved from LA, drove across country. And you're like, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? But we ended up um, in uh, Tampa where we opened up FCW and got a chance to work with Dr. Tom and Steve Kern and, all the people that they were just bringing in and giving you, like you getting a chance to pull people's, pick people's brains and stuff like that. So it really helped to formulate an understanding for what the WWE expected out of you. And, you know, a lot of guys take it and build on it and a lot of guys can't, I just couldn't, didn't want to switch. A lot of people wanted to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And that's not how that business works. So were they trying to almost like reprogram you and get you into the WWE you know, mode? Yeah. You have to. I'm like, that's their product. That's, you know what I mean? Some guys are going to go in and add their own flair to it. Um, for me, it was, you're built the way you are. You look the way you do. You bring a different level of intensity. And that's all the training, you know, from Steve Kerr and Dr. Tom. I'm like, okay, Rick, this is what, the kind of package you can deliver. And that's what I worked on all like, you know what I mean? Never, I didn't veer too much from it um, because it, it worked. And I believe that the process was going to build if I keep doing and getting better understanding how to listen to the crowd on that, on that stuff. I felt like it was going to be, it could have been bigger than, it could have been big, you know what I mean? So it was like, yep. I trusted the process. I did what I could do. I did what I was asked to do. And um, we got the results of what I had. What do you think of like the facility down there in Florida? Just because oh. it's pro- it's not like WB now with the performance center and it's, oh. you know, you know what I mean? What did you think of that back then? <laughs> if you, you, I'm not sure if, if you've heard the stories um, of, you know, we've got corn cans on one side and, we got three rings over here. Um, it was, it was shocking. Like at first, you're like, "Dang, this is WWE." You know what I mean? Right. But we understood. You know, the one thing about uh, Steve Kern that I love was his honesty. He's like, "This is just the beginning." You know what I mean? This is where we are. 
Um, Cause at one point we went to a place where people were hitting baseballs next to us. Hmm. <laughs> they practiced in baseball while we were practicing for the WWE. Then now we're in this place. And once they redid it and put on the studio, put the studio in and everything, it looked phenomenal. But the beginning was take a deep breath because you might be sucking some uh, gas from one of these um, pallet boosters. You know, right. Yeah. But again, it was it was hot. Like, you know, Dr. Tom, we, uh, he's like, the one thing I want everybody to do in this business is say that they did a one hour Broadway. So I had to do a one hour Broadway. I'll never forget. It was July 17, an hour versus uh, Tyrus right now. So the two biggest dudes doing a one hour yep. Broadway, Dr. Tom reffing. And it's like 100 degrees outside in Tampa in July. And we're dying, but we made it through. It never have to happen again, but it happened. Um, but that's the kind of stuff, like the honesty of them saying, okay, this is where we are. This is where we're trying to go. For me, I think being a married man at the time with a young baby, I kind of had a different vision of life. Like, okay, things happen. You know what I mean? I was some wild-eyed kid that was like, oh, this is our baby should be, you know what I mean? I, right. I did what I could do. I adjusted and, you know, from what it was, we worked, it worked out for me. I know Dr. Tom had a one hour Broadway with Heath Slater that he loves to talk about. <laughs> and he broke his leg in the first yep. minute of the match. Yep. <laughs> and he finished the match. Yeah. Holy Crazy. crap. Yeah. <laughs> we were all there. We watched it. We saw it. And um, Dr. Tom is Dr. Tom, man. Love that dude. What was it about him like that you got along with him so well that you liked him so much? Was it the way he trained you guys? Was he more personal with you guys? Um, he was very personal, um, very welcoming and honest. Like he's like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't I don't try to go too deep into conversations because it's not mine to share. Right. But his honesty of what the business was, what the business is and what the bus business could be. He's like, you have to adjust. He's like, I never thought I'd just be some trainer down in, you know what I mean? Um, and then you had Steve Kern, who was brutally honest, who didn't, you know what I mean? He's like, don't give me excuses, give me results. And you get that, you know, Dr. Tom, you, you work your butt off, you do the same thing 15 times, the same spot 15 times until you, it becomes natural. Um, Steve Kern will add the characters like, okay, that looked too clean, that looked too pretty. Let's make it grungy. Let's make and the two of them with uh, everybody else coming in made it phenomenal for us. As uh, for me, I, you know, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, it worked for me. Love Doctor Tom. Talk to him all the time. Uh, he <laughs> he he's the best. Yeah, he, it's funny like how uh, you know just his view of the business because you know he was a heavenly body he was wrestling he did all the territories and all of a sudden now he's the trainer but yeah. then he then he made a mark for himself with the rock and kurt angle and you mm -hmm. know all the other guys so quite a quite a career quite a, a guy to learn from too yes um all this experience you know i mean we you can't yeah as a fan of wrestling when you're a fan you first of all you get to be a fan like, I wish I'd been more of a fan when I was there. I think I tried to turn that off too much. Mm. Um, I wish I'd done more pictures or just real conversations um, with certain people. But when you're a fan and you like you understand what what's what could be in the future, you you just I just I took it all in, man. Like, you know, what I mean, you show up in the locker room like, oh, crap, Ric Flair is here. Oh, Bret Hart is here. Oh, Tony Atlas is here. Oh. You know what I mean? My first, I think my first day there, freaking Jim DeAnville Neidhart asked me to get in the ring with him, stay back and work with him. He's like, I'll need a big guy. I'm like, hell yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, you, awesome. chance, like, you, can't, you can't do that. Hell yeah. You're like, like, sure. I'll keep my boots on. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> and it was just, but you got a chance to, like, I wrestled in the ring with Jim DeAnville Neidhart. Learned a lot from that dude because he was a big guy, powerhouse, and showed me how like how gentle it was and it wasn't rough like people expected but you're making it look and it was just, just a learning experience man and <laughs> i took again i took it all in did you like dusty did you get a chance to hang out with dusty a lot oh Dusty, yeah dusty was um as i was transitioning out um we figured out uh 
I didn't, I wasn't doing as much on the shows because I guess the plans were in the works for me with uh, Kendrick. Um, but just promo class, learning how to speak. And um, again, going back to Ty, uh, Tyrus, Tyrus and I were both at UPW together for a while. And um, my complaint was I, I, as a kid, people reminded me that I had a little bit of a speech impediment. So I always was nervous about it. And Tyrus was like, just listen to this. And he put in Dusty Rose. And we just listened to promos from Dusty for like an hour and a half trip. And he's like, that man had a lisp. And he yep. took it and he ran with it. So that was always in the back of my head that this is the first guy that I got confident in being able to listen to that he didn't let anything bother him. So we got along really well. Um, just love, that's just, you know, love my family. And, and, you know, and that's the thing about me with wrestling. It was like, it wasn't all about wrestling because I involved my wife, I involved my kids. Uh, my daughter was the first div- born diva of uh, FCW. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what I mean? that. And it was like the, all three of them together at the end with Norman coming in and Billy Kidman and all these guys. They wanted the best for all the guys. It wasn't like uh, we're going to set you up to fail. It was like we're going to set you up and whatever you do with it, that's on you. And that's what I think the awesome thing about the the center, the FCW, when I was there, that's what I loved about it. It does seem more like realistic to like when you're actually working and wrestling and you're not always going to have these big gigantic arenas and these nice facilities. It was more yeah. realistic, right? For you guys, especially yeah. the younger guys, it was very realistic. Like this is the way it's going to be. And it's going to be tough at first. And then you grow into becoming bigger and better. Yeah, because we did shows, man. We did every Tuesday night, we did a show in a bar in Newport Ritchie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hour and a half traffic just to go set up in a bar. Sometimes you might have 20 people. Sometimes you might have 100 people. But you still had to take control of the crowd. And just any opportunity to get in front of a crowd, I don't care if it's 10 people or whatever, wrestlers need to take that opportunity and run with it. And you know, learn. You know, that's what they did. They give us opportunities to work on our characters, work on our craft. And if you go through that class of guys that came through from FCW, that's a a lot of dudes are that are holding strong that did phenomenal stuff within that time. You had some, again Wade Barrett, you had Heath Slater, you got Sheamus. You know what I mean? Um, these guys who do we all a bunch of kids. Well, I was the older one, but <laughs> we were a bunch of young guys, you know, and getting to live live our dream and and perform and could claim the moniker that we we're signed by the WWE. Um, that was just a part, like, really special. When they do tell you, you know, they have an idea for you and Brian Kendrick, how do they call you up, like, to the main roster? Who is the guy? Is it Johnny Ace, or how does that happen? No, you, it's, um, so... I showed up one, like a Wednesday or something like that, and Kendrick was there. I was like, hey, man, um, you know, I always, every time I see you, I got to say, give you love from Nate. Nate um, Nate was a wrestler in uh, UPW, but he also trained, and he was like him and Kendrick were boys. Little Nate. And Kendrick, huh? Little Nate. Yeah, Little Nate, yeah. yeah. And um, he was like, actually, I'm here to see you. I was like, oh. So we went in the bathroom and he's like, I got this idea. And they told me that, you know, I suggested you. And so Kendrick was the one that suggested bringing me up. So I owe that first launch to Kendrick, like, you know what I mean? Um, and he was like, whatever ideas you want to bring, you know, bring it up. Because at that time with SmackDown, they already had with La Familia. You had Bam Neely was doing the black suit. And I was like, how about the whole uh, Shug Knight thing, basically? That's what I went for. It was like yeah. the white linen suit. Like I looked into the red, but I was like, this white looked really, really good. And um, But that's how it was. I got an email with my flight <laughs> uh, for the next week, and I was flying to try out in, uh, we were in um, Baton Rouge. So I flew into New Orleans, got a car, drove to Baton Rouge, drove, back, you know, and uh, that's how it was. It was you got an email and you're going up to the, the main show. And that was what it was. 
did they basically say like, okay, we're going to be, you're going to be a bodyguard and your name's Ezekiel. Did they give you any of that kind of info either or no? You show up. Um, I was at lunch and it was like, Hey, uh, didn't get, he's like, uh, what's his name? John Carl came up. He's like, uh, what do you think of the name Ezekiel? I was like, it's not bad. <laughs> right. Um, cause you know, they ask you suggestions for your names and stuff like that. And, my my suggestion is one of my favorite biblical characters was Gideon, and uh, but somehow Ezekiel came in, and then the next week was like, okay, we need a last name, hmm. you know, and we got Jackson. And I, in my head, in my head, in the long run, I'm playing off of my one of my favorite '80s movies, Action Jackson. That was my goal to be yeah, my uh, yeah. that was that was my goal. It was like we're gonna build Ezekiel, but our goal is to get to Action Jackson. And, you know, we didn't hit that, but. <laughs> Long, I was thinking long game. Were you okay though with Ezekiel Jackson though? Because so many guys were like, oh, I hate that name, or ah, oh, they gave me this crap. And were you okay with it in the long run though? Man, like going back to my current preaching and biblical, and Ezekiel is a character that I knew and I understood. Um, when we went with the ECW stuff with the Prophet of Doom that uh, Matt Stryker was trying to launch, I was start, I was quoting the book of Ezekiel. That's where the finisher came, you know in the book of Eli, <laughs> um, yeah. the book of Ezekiel came in and we were doing the prophet of doom and Ezekiel 716 says the end is coming and is awakened against you. And I, I was building on that, but it didn't, it didn't pan out the way <laughs> I thought it could have. What did you think about the pairing with Kendrick? Did you like it? Did you guys have chemistry? Oh yeah. We had phenomenal chemistry, man. Um, he, uh, he learned from the best. He learned from Regal and he learned from Sean and he got a chance. And I'm sitting in cars with him and soaking that in. So a lot of the stuff that I branched still do if I was to wrestle is stuff that he fed me. It's like, and I use it. Like it's, it, it really, it really it was a good pairing. Um, for whatever reason, they split us and put him on, draw on me on ECW. Um, <laughs> business decisions. <laughs> That's all I can say is business decisions. And, uh, but it worked out for me. Um, I think he was still back in the company up until, you know, I was happy when he won the, uh, 205 championship and I texted him right away. You know what I mean? So it, it worked, it worked great for what it was. I think it could get a lot more momentum. A lot of things happened that I don't, I didn't have control over it. It's funny though, it's his idea, then he gets split up. You know what I mean? Like it was kind yeah. of his idea to bring you guys together and then all of a sudden you're not together anymore. It's, I don't know, it's a little like maybe a little confusing for you guys. Um, yeah. It's you know, I, I found out online that I was going to ECW. Um, I think I was home. We were we were separated for a couple of months, and then that's when I found out I was gonna be an ECW. Then I focused on my training and um because it's just it's disheartening when you've been on TV consistently. You know, we started in July, I think it was in July. I debuted in um, North Carolina, and we do I'm doing this stuff, and we got these going. Then we do the tag team stuff versus Primo and Carlito, and then nothing for a while. And so it's very disheartening. You're like, dang, did I do something? Did he do something? Like, you know what I mean? And um, but I, I. I took it with a stride. I was like, okay, what's next? Let me be in the be in best shape, be ready for whatever. Keep sending, you know, submit some ideas, whatever stakes. Hopefully something stakes. And that's how it is. With ECW, like you said, you found out online. That's funny too. They don't like tell you. They it's just like online. And then all of a sudden, oh, I guess I'm in ECW. That's kind of <laughs> strange, right? They don't even give you the heads up. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was, um, man. You, you're dealing with a, a, a gigantic business and most of the decisions are business related. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of guys that knows exactly, you know, the week before, you know, when you went, I was told this, this is the easiest way to explain it. You want to be within that top echelon of guys where there's 10, probably eight to 10 to 12 guys that, knows their whole programming 
for the next until the next pay per view. Um, most of the other guys are just showing up and hoping to get on TV, um, hoping to have a match. And you don't want to be one of those guys because, again, one week you're on TV, one week you're off, and like, dang, the fans don't really know who I am or they don't remember me because they haven't seen me for three weeks. Or, you know what I mean? So it puts a lot of uh, a mental challenge and you have to just flow with it. So not being told, like, I already understood that it's just a part of the business. Like, yeah, I'm on ECW, great. I'm still on TV. Let's figure this out. Let's go. Um, and that was just the way I approach it. Like, I'm ready for whatever. When you do go to ECW, what are you thinking? Are you thinking it's the third brand or you're, you know, you're happy because you're going to be getting a lot of TV time and, you know, you're going to be, uh, premiered, I guess. It started, um, I think I debuted in, um, Bakersfield. So I was home that week and I got to drive to Bakersfield and I was like, oh, you're going to be on you guys a match tonight against this kid um and uh we got new music for you i didn't have before i used to come out to um kendrick's music right so i went out and i heard the music i was like okay that's badass um domination cool i could play on that and i just in my head my character started shifting to match that domination thing um we figured out my finish that uh that day <laughs> before the show mm-hmm. And um, I went out there. The kid like made me look phenomenal. Um, rest in peace to that kid. I found out he died a couple of like a year and a half later. Um, but Jack, uh, he he made me look good. Sold his butt off for me. And um, we built. I think we kind of. Which I was like, it seemed like I was trading something with Seamus. One week I'm on, Seamus was on. Um, but then Seamus went to Shelton, and then I started with the Vladimir. Um, Kozlov, yeah. that thing where we started doing the thing and um, you know but it built into something that I really like I, man I wish they had put us on Raw as a group uh, that round table with Regal and myself and um, Oleg um, but it you know it led to me getting the ECW ch- uh, championship so I'm uh, <laughs> it worked out in the long run like, and that's the way I look at stuff man it's like everything that kind of you wish more and you wish you had done more, but for what it was, it worked out for, for me. Yeah, for sure. We ended up working out. what did you think of like just the pairing or really, really the trio with Kozlov and Regal? Did you like that? Like you guys together? I know you said you should have been on raw or could have been on raw, but did you like that, that pairing or that trio in ECW? Yeah. Um, like I was saying earlier with being, so you'd know we knew where we were going with the program. I mean, after after they put us together, it's like, okay, Rigo's gonna chase Christian and then you know what I mean? Um But we knew when again, when you know you're gonna be on TV, you know what's coming up, you got you show up and you're like, Okay, I already got my whatever I'm supposed to do on TV, I know it uh, it alleviates a lot of stress backstage. Because you see, you know what I mean? Like I was saying, there's guys that are coming back that don't know what's, if they're going to be on TV, you walk in, you go into the um, talent relations office and, you know, you don't, do, you don't do it like purposely, but you're looking at the wall to see, am I, am I there for a match? Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. But when you know you have something set, a lot of stress is alleviated. So with uh, the respect everybody had for Miss William, uh, William, William Regal, um, I learned so much from that dude. Oh man. Uh, so because again, Kendrick always shared what he learned from him. And then I got a chance to pick his brain, stand on a, stand on a apron next to him while Cloud Club was working, listening as I'm, he's teaching, he's always teaching. And, um, yeah, so it was like, it, 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 it was a really good experience. Um, again, I thought given an opportunity, I want Raw or SmackDown, it would have been a different level and they, that that uh that group would have done some damage what's like the best piece of advice regal gave to you because he seems like a, a fountain of knowledge <sighs> make it look real <laughs> hmm. and that was it and man, that's and i got that from him i got that from steve kern and every time i got into the ring my 
my approach to wrestling or performing is I don't want anybody in the audience to think they could take one of my moves hmm. ever. And that was the way I approached it. So I threw everything with as much mad intent as I possibly could, but safely. And that's one of the things I studied. Like I really worked on how to hit and make sure people, you know, we understand where we are. We understand it's entertainment, but I want you to leave like, I don't trust that guy. <laughs> He's really right. trying to rip my head off. You know what I mean? Yeah. As a fan, I have, and that's the approach that I got from Regal and that. The gnarling and the scowling and the oh, like all that stuff is he's like you do all that you don't have to do as much as <laughs> do all the flippity do stuff you know what i mean he's like yeah. make sure if, if people believe it's a fight and so i think he, with just spending that time with him really just put a lot of different perspective on me on how to approach a match and he's like, every time every time you go out there, there's a story. Even if it's a match where nobody knows, he's like, create a story. This dude pitched your mom, talking about your mama. And you create a story off of that, you know what I mean? And so I definitely uh, learned that from him. Um, we got a chance to be with neighbors down in uh, Georgia for a couple of years. And it was just not, you know, we flip, be on the same flight, end up riding home a few times together and just always willing to share knowledge, man. So, you know. I, I'm. <laughs> if you get a chance to just when you read his tweets or you know, you get a chance to pick his brain, pick his brain, man, because he he got so much knowledge. Do you think that they put him with you because they saw some potential in you? So they're like, let's put him with somebody that's a great veteran that that'll kind of lead him in the right direction. I I believed that. Yes, I thought it was you know at first. We didn't know what was happening. Um, and then the thing with Christian happened where we he got the match with him at SummerSlam and, you know, time time changed and all that stuff. So we ended up having to do what the, it was a quick finish at uh, SummerSlam and then we attacked Christian. But I do think that was something where maybe I needed to, I know I needed guidance um, because again, I didn't, I was trying to be a sponge to learn as much as I can, but you also can't see yourself. So you need honest people. And he was very honest. He's like, you know what I mean? Best compliment I ever got was from, from him. He was like, dude, for a big man, your footwork is probably, you know, it's really good. Cause you know, I, I walked slow because I was a big guy, but when it was time to attack, I attacked. And that's, you know, just levels. But I think that's what they, they were maybe hoping. Like, I think, you know, with me becoming the champion, the final ECW champion, I'm sure that was a, a build there. And um, so the next levels were up to me when they put me back on SmackDown. Did you know when you won the ECW championship, like how far in advance did you know you were going to win the title? Two hours, maybe. Wow. Maybe uh, I showed up and uh, IRS was our agent. He's like, "Hey, Zika, you getting the title tonight?" Like, oh really? <laughs> I didn't know, but you know what I mean. Um, when we worked it out and the match came down with everybody's parts, take just a lot of schmas with Zack Ryder mm-hmm. and I think Rosa, and then you have Regal with doing it. Um, it worked out really well. Did you know, like, okay, ECW's gone. I'm going to be the last champion. This is something, you know, you can kind of make a resume builder. I'm the last ever ECW champion. Was that something on your mind? Um, it was, you know, again, I, people always say, what what aspect do you use? I'm like, if you're a pessimist, I was a short, uh, short reigning champion. If you're an optimist, it, I, I never lost the title. So, right. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it's going on 12 years and, uh, Still undefeated as ECW champ, I guess. Do you think that's a good thing though, or a bad thing? As far as like, okay, I'm the last ECW champion, but like the brand ended, so it's almost like not forgotten, but it's almost like, oh, I guess I'm the you know the last one. And you know, I, I was watching uh, Zach t- tag me in something when he was, uh, I think he was a, a show somewhere in Michigan that he was going to wrestle um, Rhino. 
so he tagged me in that. He's like, you know, the original, the official last ECW champion, Ezekiel Jackson, and yeah, you know, got some heat off of it. Yep. And it was, again, it, it was business, man. I did, I can claim more one time world champion as a, and for me, as a freaking kid out of the poorest of neighborhoods in the poorest of countries of the world, uh, coming in and living in America and one of, in three of the most dangerous neighborhoods ever to make it to the WWE to say I have a title or two titles from them. I I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> Whether somebody wants to say is use it negatively or whatever, that's on them. You know what I mean? I know my life. I know my journey. I know where I wanted to go. I knew where I ended up and I, I counted all the blessings. Were you ever a fan of the original ECW? Like when it, when it first was banged or no, or you weren't familiar? I, I was again, I, I heard about the tapes and I saw a couple of the tapes at the doghouse. Um, I watched a couple of them in, cause I lived in Brooklyn. I watched a few of the like late night on, I can't remember what channel, but some ECW stuff would show up. Um, I, I was just always a fan of the WWE. Like I, I studied a lot of the, when they trained us at the doghouse was a lot of Japanese style, uh, strong style. Um, but the WWE was just, you know, it for me. That's where I wanted to be. That's where Bad News Brown went through. That's where Ultimate Warrior, that's where Dino Bravo, the big muscular guys, and then, you know I mean, the Hogan's and all that. Like, that's what I saw as Pinnacle, and that's like everything else just uh, failed in comparison to that. So when ECW ends and you go back to SmackDown, what's the thought in your head? Like, okay, because are you yeah, pessimistic I, or optimistic? I'm super pessimistic. I'm ready to go. Like, I'm like, here we go. <laughs> um, but then um, I think I debuted. I was supposed to debut in early March. Um, but then my dad died. <laughs> So it was like, I'm on this high from winning the championship, hoping I'm like, you know, some good, some really good rumors were swirling around on next level and I was smiling and, you know, then my dad died and it, it threw me for a loop, but I buried my dad on April 3rd. Um, he died on March 25th. I buried him on April 3rd. Flew to Europe. I'm wrestling Kane. I'm like, I got a whole 12 matches lined up with Kane throughout Europe. And I tore my quad on the third show in Scotland. Um, and that completely just threw me off. Like, how do you know, how do you come back from this? So I uh, I, I think I called Triple H because he done torn his quad and he just he's like treated like the hardest leg workout you've ever had in your life. Up your 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 fish oils and the glutamines and the creatines and the stuff to rebuild. And um, I was back, you know, thankfully I was back in the ring five months to the day I tore my quad. Um, I do feel like I rushed it because that's when the nexus was big. And when you're home, you're like, dang, am I going to do they want me back? You know, that that mode of yep. mental mental game starts playing. Like, man, they could just call me and fire me now. They, you know what I mean? And so it's like I felt like I rushed to get back. Um and they really didn't have any spots on because Nexus was doing their thing. And um, it was just so much happening with such a big group. They had to fit those guys into so much that it wasn't room for much people. So, but I came back and they, I think, pushed me out. We did um, the Bragging Rights where I was on Team, was that Team Raw? Or something? I think it was Team Raw. <laughs> um, but they made, it was my big comeback, but they introduced me like third and brought out the big star after me. So kind of, mm. uh, you know what I mean? Um, but it's what it was. Again, I, I rushed back, you know, it, um, it just, it was challenging, but I was back and ready to go. When that injury happens, you come back. Is that when you go to the core? When they yeah. do they split you up and you go to SmackDown, and it was like the offshoot of the Nexus, basically. Yeah. So I was on SmackDown. Um, 
for a couple of weeks, I was just backstage. After Bragging Rights, I was like, okay, where do we go from here? Oh, uh, nothing, 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 nothing. Then uh, we were in Alabama, and I was like, you're like, okay, we're doing this tonight. Uh, Birmingham. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's where the first time I body slammed the big show Yep, um, was there. And then we built off of the core thing. And, you know, again, that's, man, for me, uh, like, there's so much more, like, I could have done. Because I don't know if you remember, like, there was one point where I suplexed the big show. And that was basically, I tore my peg. <laughs> wow. Um, so it was like, that's why for the most of the core, I was uh, just a bodyguard. I was outside again with a tank top because my back was torn. It wasn't to the point where I needed surgery, but it was enough to the point where I couldn't do too much wrestling other than a clothesline or uh, I could have body slammed because, you know, yeah. um, but that was it. Like, so injury really got me like in, in my head. I'm like, I couldn't go through surgery six months after coming back from surgery. So we healed that up and then we built into the, where it was me versus Wade going into uh, that summer. But, it, you know, to come back from a torn quad and five, like in February, I tear my peg. I'm like, holy crap. Um, so a string of uh, bad days <laughs> kicked in. Yep. And, um, but we, you know, they thankfully they were willing to just let me do go at my pace. The doctors were checking in on me, making sure I was good. And once I was able to start back lifting through that side of the chest, then it's like, okay, we can go now. And that's where they started leading me to the after post WrestleMania, we had a match at Mania with um again, April third, twenty ten, I buried my dad, April third, twenty eleven, I'm re- at performing at WrestleMania in front of 85,000 people. So, you know, next day I was like, okay, big meeting. This is the plan. Next day it all changed. <laughs> mm. Of course. Typical, right? It all changed. I was like, oh, okay. So, but does that, that happen you know, a lot? These changes just I happen? So. I think so. It's like, you see it in different programs, just watching, you know, I'm still a fan. I actually just finished watching, uh, raw. Um, Watch it. Watch a lot of it on fast forward because um, have to, yeah. You know, I I enjoy. For me, I enjoy the character stuff. The matches, I, I in my head, I'm sitting there criticizing too much, so I try not to. I I, I wouldn't get to enjoy certain matches. I can I really look into look forward to um, certain people. I just look forward to watching everything they do, and um, but yeah, it's. Man, it's it's a lot of changes happen. You know, we was that WrestleMania match, I think we had twelve minutes. It was supposed to be like twelve to fifteen minutes, and by the time we got to Gorilla's like, you guys got six. <laughs> so it was just entrance. Our entrance as a group, Big Show Kane, Kofi, Santino, this he started this, 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 this. Zeke, you got your clothesline on Big Show, Big Kane clothesline. And that was it. <laughs> like, that was my mania moment. But again, I wouldn't change that for anything because a year before, I'm, I'm at a uh, burial ground with my dad, you know, right. watching my dad going to a ground. So that's how, uh, that's how life is. So with you and, and kind of getting a little bit of a push, you beat mm-hmm. Big Show, then you beat Wade Barrett for the IC mm-hmm. title, the Capital Punishment pay per view. Did mm-hmm. you feel like a momentum, like wow, I'm you know I'm the IC champion? I mean, this yeah. is big time here. Were you feeling the, like the big push was coming your way? And because in the past, <laughs> the IC championship had meant yep. Next, once you drop that, it's like. You know, we saw it with Sean, Brett, all these cats. It's like next level. So I'm like, cool, I'm ready to go. Then they're like, you know, we got this feud going with Cody. I'm like, cool, we we'll make probably make it to SummerSlam. Um, I get my SummerSlam match with Cody and whatever which way I'm ready for whatever. Um to lose the title the the, <laughs> the SmackDown before SummerSlam was really weird. Um 
I was like, God, no, I really couldn't even get a SummerSlam match. Um, I showed up and I didn't even know I was losing the title that night. <laughs> I just found out from Cody. He's like, oh, so you're dropping the title again. I was like, oh, okay. And you know what I mean? But again, they were building Cody. I thought, okay, cool. You know, maybe I'm going on this level. I'm ready to move on and thing. And it just fell off. I just was backstage. I was doing Superstar. Then they had me doing NXT, dancing with uh, the great Kali. Um, <laughs> right. I remember that. And we did um, a bunch of dark matches and stuff like that. And then just, they got to that point where after the peck entry had uh, healed somewhat, but that ro- the rotator cuff was doing all the work. So I ended up popping that rotator cuff in a match in Vancouver. And after I realized that, you know, I suggested something for summer, for Royal Rumble. And then I see Mania season coming up and Mania, I was like, okay, cool. We could do this. Then that switched. <laughs> um, I just was like, I was in so much pain. Like I couldn't sit without holding this arm up, my left arm. I would sit like this to hold this arm up. And um, I just went and had it checked out. They're like, this is, if you didn't come in now, you'd probably never be able to use this arm again. So I went in, wow. had the sur- yeah, I went in, had the surgery. And basically that was it for my uh, WWE career. Um, they let me, I sat at home for almost, that was 2012. My contract went until 2014. And they never brought me back. I think they brought me up to Mania in uh, New York. I did a match. My last match was uh, Huniko and myself versus Yoshi Tatsu and I can't even remember who his partner was. Probably um, Mysterio, but not very. Right. What's the what's the kid's name? Sinkara. Sinkara. I think that was like like my final match or something like that. And um, but yeah, that was it. I uh, I stayed home and started figuring, okay, life may be changing soon. And uh, <laughs> that's we moved from Georgia to LA so that my family could get back into acting, just in case. Ooh. Were you pissed at all, though? Because it seems like you were in line for a big push. Vince probably likes you. You got the size. You got the look. You know, you have everything about you. And then all of a sudden just gets derailed without any explanation. Were you mad? And that's the hard, the hard thing for for wrestlers in a big company like that is you can't, you don't know what the, what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's no real... Hey uh, Zeke, we need you to do. If if somebody came to me and said, Hey Zeke, this is what we expect from you, and you're not meeting this right now, I could turn it on. But if I don't know what's happening, I show up and like I come back through the curtain and you're like you get one of these. You're like, cool, I'm doing my job. But then I come to find out you're not doing the level that they. I'm not as intense as they wanted. I'm not as angry as they wanted. I'm not. You know, I mean, some of the promos I was given. Um, that was written for me when I was IC champ. I was like, dude, I don't use that word. I'm like, <laughs> I might be from Brooklyn, but I don't have a Brooklyn accent. I don't have a Brooklyn vibe to me. That's not my thing. I'm Caribbean. I'm still, that's when they switched me to my, the guy oh, from Guyana, South America. Um, oh, so, okay, maybe I could use my accent. Uh, too many people using accents. I'm like, nobody's using the Guyanese accent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, yeah. So, uh, you know, and two years ago, I think I finally read, we read an email from uh, Michael Hayes, and it put a lot of stuff into perspective for me. And I was like, hmm, okay, maybe I should have read this much uh, earlier than now and from this vantage point. And um, so it kind of gave me a closure and understanding, like, there were things that they were probably expecting that I wasn't delivering on. And... I could sit back now and probably watch some of those matches because I was probably, I was probably bummed because <laughs> I was expecting again, I see champ, let's keep going this way. And then nope. You know what I mean? So I'm sure the mental screw job completely threw me off and I was like, I was out of it. So some of those matches, I'm probably just like, Oh, let me get through this match. Let me get through this. Match. You know what I mean? Yep. And it's, um, again, I don't, I don't know what the, backstage is like now on whether they're more commu- they communicate more with these guys or not i have no idea 
but it's still if you ex if if you have a talent and you know this talent can deliver why not gather him in a room and say hey this is what we need from you this is yeah. what you should be this is what should be happening every night you on tv and that like just those you know, you get it from a, you get it from a coach and a football team, basketball. Son's playing basketball and football. The coach is going to be like, "RJ, this is what we need from you." RJ, we know when you come off the bench, you're going to be firing up. RJ, when you tackle, you're going to rip somebody. You know what I mean? And that's I think if they add that aspect to just the the uh, entertainment part of it, like this is what we need. I think the business would be phenomenal, man. But don't let people go out there and fail, 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 fail. And you're like, oh, you didn't do what we asked you to do. Like, I didn't know what you wanted. You know, right. There was no communication there. Yeah. Yeah. So after WB, you kind of winded it down for just wrestling, right? I mean, you, you, I know you were at Impact for a little bit, Lucha Underground, but you weren't really planning on maybe being full time wrestler anymore? Um, I saw the wrestler. <laughs> the mm. movie i think it was right before i got signed and the scene that where they, you know, the guy was bragging the promoter was bragging about how big this uh con event was gonna be how uh you know they, i got this guy gonna be there signing got this guy gonna be there signing and then the scene shows up it's like five dudes in a room one dude with a freaking urine thing connected to his pants and I, sw I said to myself, and I, I was like, I would never be that guy. I would never just show up just to sign, just because. I think I've done maybe three signings since I've left the WWE. I did one independent match in Philadelphia, or somewhere in Pennsylvania. And I did, uh, went to Ger Germany and Switzerland a couple of times. But that was it. Like, I just didn't want, I don't, I don't want people feeling sympathy for me. You know what I mean? I, and that's what I feel like when I saw that scene. And even when I do some of these signings, I'm like, after about two hours of signing, I'm like, I could leave. I'm okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I didn't pursue it. I didn't, I, you know, I did a match in uh, WX, is it WXW? In, Germany. And after the match, I said, I was like, man, it was such a fun match because the kid that I was working with, you know, I worked their champion the night before and he wanted to hit me like an F5 or something like that. This kid is like, my, he was about 6'3", but 180 pounds. I was like, hell no, you're not X5. It's not giving me a, hmm. you know what I mean? Yep. So he, I think he got, he tried to manhandle me in the match and then it didn't work out in his favor. Um, so after that, I'm like, I'm, I'm used to producers saying, Hey, this is what we're going to do. And let's put this together. And I'm not going to fight some dude who's making a few hundred bucks to, <laughs> to just to prove a point, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, then he didn't want to wrestle me the next night. So we ended up in like a tag match and he didn't get in the ring with me at all. Um, but I had fun with the little kid, like that was whatever he, he thought he was bigger than he was. You know what I mean? And after that match, I said, uh, man, if that was my final match, that would have been a good, that would be a, I said, that would be a good final match if that was my final match. And that's all somebody heard final match. And I got on Twitter, I'm like, oh, Ezekiel Jackson announced his retirement. I'm like, did I? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I got a phone call. I was working with Bill Barons at the time. Uh, Zeke, did you? I'm like, I guess that's what they heard. And the Twitter ran with it. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So are you officially retired now? There's still some stuff I would love to do. I'm always in shape. I'm always, you know, I'm a bit bigger now than I was when I was in WWE. Um, when I was there, I was about 285. Now I'm 330. Um, <laughs> I, um, there's a few things I would love to do. Be real. Like, I still get that itch ever so often, but it's not going to be anything small. I'm not just, sorry, I, I can't. Uh, my business is, my personal training business is doing phenomenal. My kids, my son is just switched from basketball. He's still playing basketball, but mentality just switched from basketball to football. So I'm being, I'm about to make him bigger than me. 
Um, <laughs> um, my daughter is a fencer, an actress. She's getting like at 13, she's getting offers for roles, for adult roles in theater. And so, you know, I, I, I live, I, I'm okay with where I am, but that itch is always there that I may want to scratch. So as we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish here yeah. again. You were saying about you know personal training and staying in shape and stuff. How do you kind of just stay in shape? Is it working out all the time? Is it eating right? Is it a combination of, of both? Um, for me, it's it's mostly is eating, and people don't get that. Um, it's good you can lift weights, you can do cardio, but if you're not eating correctly, your body's not going to show what it's supposed to show. So eighty percent of it, I take it as eating. Um, you can lift. Heavy, you can lift light, you can do whatever. You want to be consistent with your li- with your training. You want to be consistent with your cardio because of the health aspect. But most importantly, you want to be consistent with your eating. And the thing is, I think people rush, and they, they you know we're in a fast paced society where you want stuff really quick, and we're no longer like the body doesn't work like that. Um, and for for to be real, like I, my I've been trying to. You know, um, a buddy of mine died a few years ago. Uh, his name is Imani Lee. He was actually signed with the WWE also. Um, he was one of Batista's best friends, and he did movies with Michael J. White and, you know, him and Shad. We all, we all boys. And when he died, they said his heart was enlarged. And that put a fear on me of, man, I need to do more cardio. I need to get in shape. But, but, you know, um, my heart is great. <laughs> my health is great. And sometimes I enjoy my weekends way too much. <laughs> hmm, gotcha. Um, you know what I mean? But it's it's shifted. I, I gotten all the way up to, sadly, 348 pounds, which wasn't good. Um, I'm down about 325 right now. I started back in, um, we went to Hawaii for Christmas. We got back home. And I started that week. So I'm on a journey to about, my goal ideal is about 255. Um, but it's, again, it's the eating. You could train, I love lifting heavy weights, man. Like it's my escape. I've, I've never been into drugs. I've never been into too much dr- to drinking, partying. Like I love heavy weights and that's just my <laughs> my thing. Um, and for most people it's like, just be consistent with what you want. If you want something, be consistent. Find uh, any plan. Google any workout plan and stick to it for more than three three days and see what happens. Well, you so, could, or you could jump on my website and grab one of my plans. <laughs> so for you, though, like as far as wrestling, you said you still have some things to, to do. Anything yeah. like regrets-wise that you would say like, oh, I should have done this or should have done that? I, I, sh- I should have taken a shot with the Undertaker of that Jack Daniels. Um, <laughs> I should have hung out more with the, the boys. Um, Cause for me it was TV. Get back to my room. Call my wife. Get ready for the next day. Um, I think I could have built more of a rapport with the uh, some of the guys. Um, because it is the culture of wrestling. I didn't, you know, but I told you, I'm preaching now. So I've always had the stigma. And it's not even about drinking. It's just like I worked in clubs and saw what drinking did to people and how it changed them. So I always had that thing that I didn't like about it. Um, but I wasn't the only one that didn't drink. You know what I mean? We, I got it. I was there with two other guys that didn't drink. So, you know, we chased a Pepsi. Um, mm. or do Red Bull. Um, I should have. I felt like like sometimes I walked too close to not piss people off. You know what I mean? Because for me, I, I for me, I tried. My goal was to get along with everybody. Um, I'm still friends with most of the lighting guys and the camera guys and the. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I built that relationship like in the office stuff and that thing. Um, 
but I I could have done a bit more to build camaraderie with some of the wrestlers that was there with me uh, at the time with the veterans. Uh, so a big show took took me on a took me under his wing. You know what I mean? Undertaker like he like showed up to our building early to work with me and the ring to help me. You know what I mean? This is yeah. when I was a Kendrick. Um, Triple H would you know point stuff out and I got it so Arn Anderson would just knowledge so I I probably could have done a bit more instead of just taking and starting to really relax a bit around everybody um but that was it like nothing that like nothing spectacular, it's just but you know what I mean. Just the simple. Yep. Sometimes it's the, the little things that you miss out, you didn't do that would have possibly benefited your, could have probably been, benefited me more. Um, but that that's about it. A few things that I should have done, which was to ease, stop being as uptight as I was. <laughs> yep. Gotcha. Now, yeah. before uh, let you go, give us all the plugs, your social media, and the website, of course, again. Um. Again. Ricklon.com is my website. My uh, Instagram is Ricklon, uh, at Ricklon. And my Twitter is Ricklon S. Somebody on there has my regular name and I'm mad as hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to contact Twitter for years to get my name back. Uh, it's, um, but yeah, just, you know, I my website has a bunch of workouts that for athletes, for mass gain, and for strength. I got my favorite arm workout on. I still, still yeah, got 20-something 20, 20, yeah. 20 inch arms. Um, <laughs> stupid. And uh, yeah, just I'm. I I try to to like let people see the real version of me. I'm not like I like this conversation is fun for me. I don't I don't talk trash about people. I don't try to make a name for myself out of bashing anybody i'm like everybody have a chance to make a mistake and should be able to uh, recoup recover from it so right that's it great stuff ricklon thank you so much for all the time really appreciate it sure man thank you so much